Good afternoon. You are watching Ask Us Anything About When to Take Your Child to the Emergency Room. I'm Barbara Shindo. According to the National Institutes of Health, about 30 million kids go to the emergency room every year. And we know that trips to the emergency room can be stressful and frightening, can cause a lot of anxiety. But with the right information, we can help reduce some of that anxiety, prepare you and your family for any potential trip to the emergency room, and hopefully help you have a more positive experience. So joining me today to talk about what parents should know when you need to take your child to the emergency room are Dr. Kathy McCanns, who is the Division Chief of Pediatric Emergency Medicine, and also April Squares, who is a registered nurse and clinical staff leader at uh, Penn State Health Children's Hospital in the, in the uh, Pediatric Emergency Department. Uh, so thank you both for joining me today. We appreciate your time. And we also welcome your questions for April and Dr. McCanns. If you have any questions about when to take your child to the emergency room, uh, please feel free to put your questions in the chat right below this uh, video and we will get an answer for you. And we can do that whether you're watching now live or if you're watching this on playback. So to get started, we'll first mention that uh, Penn State Health Children's Hospital is the only level one pediatric trauma center in South Central Pennsylvania and the only hospital that has a dedicated pediatric emergency department. So let's start start with you, April. Talk a little bit about, you know, what exactly does that mean and, and why does that make this um, the emergency department at Penn State Health Children's Hospital different than a typical emergency room? Sure, so coming to a dedicated pediatric emergency department means that you're gonna have access to um, a bunch of different specialties who have pediatric providers. In addition to that, all of our nurses, physicians, um, and PCAs are pediatric specifically trained. And we also have access to child life therapy, music therapy, um, and other resources to help ease your transition into the emergency department. We know it can be a scary time for your child. So we have a bunch of resources as soon as you walk in the door to help make that trend that a little bit easier for you. Okay, thank you, April. Um, and now we'll start with Dr. McCanns. I know there is, there's probably a lot of curiosity about different types of injuries. Um, you know, I was telling you both before we started here that I have a lot of girlfriends that have young kids and they get very anxious when something happens and are, are thinking, you know, when do I need to take my department. So Dr. McCann's, let's start with some of these, um, some of these potential injuries or, or illnesses and when it might be necessary to go to the emergency department. So let's start with um, a fever. Let's say your child has a fever that may be low grade fever or high grade fever. You know, when should, when should a parent start thinking about making the trip to the emergency room versus just calling your pediatrician? That's a great question and one that um, I really am fairly passionate about because fever is your friend. <clears throat> particularly in young children. It is their body's way of responding to any um, infection, whether it's a minor cold or something potentially more serious. So the first thing people need to really know is don't be afraid of a simple fever. It is your child's way of fighting the infection. It actually helps to kill off viruses and bacteria. And so it really is a good thing. Um, there's really only one reason that we treat a fever and that is to help a child feel better because when children feel poorly, they may not drink or eat or they may be very fussy and irritable and it's stressful for the child and the family. So um, it's always a good idea to call your pediatrician um, if your child is otherwise acting well but has a fever. They'll talk you through it. They will help triage um, whether the child can can come in and be seen in their office, whether that needs to happen on the same day or can wait a day or two. Um, they'll provide you instructions on supportive care. Um, I always say that fever becomes an emergency if there's fever and additional symptoms that are causing concern. So if the fever, if there's a fever and the child is struggling to breathe or has an all over body rash or is really ill appearing according to the parents, can't be aroused or is just too sleepy and that's what's scary. Um, so fever and additional symptoms that are causing concern, um, severe vomiting and diarrhea and the child's not urinating, the family feels they're becoming dehydrated. Those are the additional symptoms that make the fever an emergency. And there's really not a temperature which in and of itself makes this an emergency. It's really the fever plus other symptoms or the family sense that things are really going poorly and it's not safe because an emergency is really defined 
by the lay person's perception that this isn't safe to stay at home with, that um, a person needs um, urgent or immediate care. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up about um, there's not a specific temperature that would cause the emergency because I would think a lot of folks might think, you know, a, a 103 fever is, is much more dangerous or scary than, a, you know, a 99 or 100. But it, you're thinking there may be circumstances where a fever that high is, is totally treatable at home. Right. So, I mean, I've seen children with 104 fevers who are running around and playing. That is not a child who has a dangerous fever. Um, and we, fever really starts at 100.4. If it's less than 100.4 in pediatrics, we don't really consider that a true fever, um, which is also something people don't realize. Um, and children tend to have higher fevers that last longer than um, older children or adults, most likely in part because they are using fever as their primary immune response since they may not have been exposed to very many viruses or bacteria that can make us sick and they may not have antibodies. Um, and certainly in children who are immunized, those things that historically cause serious um, problems for um, young children are much less common because they already have immunity provided by those vaccines they've received. Okay, and what about, um, you know, injuries at home, like an accident or a fall where it might appear that your child um, has a head injury? At what point would it, would it be necessary to take your child to an emergency room if that happens at home? So if the child appears ill or out of it, um, has significant symptoms like repeated vomiting, um, has a seizure, is um, seems like they are altered by the head injury, that is an urgent and emergent problem that care should be sought. If it is, the child seems completely fine but struck their head, um, talking to your pediatrician is, is likely a good idea if you're worried. Um, if there's just a simple um, bruise, particularly on the forehead, um, talk to your pediatrician. It's really about the fact that the child had a head injury of some sort, banged their head, and now what is happening? So mm -hmm. if they are out of it, if they've had a seizure, if they look ill, um, if the family, again, feels like this isn't right, my child's not doing well, that's when I think they need to seek care. And uh, how concerned they are should guide whether they call their pediatrician for guidance um, or come directly to the emergency department. And certainly if the child's having a seizure, um, severe bleeding or seems to have um, neurologic symptoms is, is very out of it, that's even an indica indication that they should consider calling 911 and having ambulance transport the child to the emergency department. Okay, thank you, Dr. McCanns. Um, you are watching Ask Us Anything About When to Take Your Child to the Emergency Room with Dr. Kathy McCanns and April Squares from Penn State Health Children's Hospital Pediatric Emergency Department. We welcome your questions for Dr. McCanns or April. If you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat right below this post and we will get an answer for you. So um, let's talk a little bit about what to expect when you get to the emergency room. Let's say, you know, something happens at home or your child is ill and you, you um, either made the decision or spoke with your pediatrician and they say, you know, it's time to go to the emergency room. April, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what should the family expect when they get there? You know, what happens once you get to the emergency department? Sure. So you're going to enter the emergency department. You'll be registered um, with the child's name and birth date. And then shortly after arrival, you'll be triaged by one of our pediatric specifically trained triage nurses. Um, it's at that point that your child's initial vital signs will be taken. We'll go over some brief health history um, and really get into the details of the reason that you're there for your visit. Um, the triage nurse will determine um, the acuity of your child's needs, um, and that takes into account their symptoms, um, their risk of worsened symptoms, um, and then you are placed in um, an acuity line based on the reason for your visit. So depending on our volume, sometimes that means that you will go back out to our waiting room um, sometimes that means you'll go right back to a room, um, and sometimes that means you may be placed in alternate areas. Um, our biggest goal is to make sure that we see every child within an appropriate time frame based on their symptoms. So that may mean that you are assessed by a physician or a resident 
um, in a non-traditional space. Um, during times of high volume, that may mean that you're seen in a stretcher in one of our hallway beds, um, that you're seen in an internal waiting room. Um, but again, the true intention of that is that so we can see you as soon as possible based on the symptoms that your child is brought in for. Um, from there, you're typically placed into a regular pediatric ED room. Um, you'll have studies done. You may have had those studies done while you were waiting. If your child is there and needs an x-ray, sometimes the x-ray text will get you from the waiting room to expedite that care while you're waiting for a pediatric room. Um, once you're in a room, you'll be treated by a pediatric specifically trained nurse um, and a physician who is trained in pediatric emergency medicine. <clears throat> and then from there, we'll provide the care that you need. Um, once some of that is done, you may also be asked to move back to an internal waiting room um, while we finish your evaluation and your treatment. And again, that's just so we can expedite care through all of the patients that we need to see. Mm -hmm. And is there anything, um, you know, parents or guardians, families should know about um, preparations? Is there anything specific they should bring along with them or they should, they should know or have before they come? Um, not necessarily, especially in a true emergent situation. Um, we have everything that you may need during your stay. Just please speak up and remember that you are um, your child's strongest advocate. So if you have a gut feeling that something is wrong, definitely speak up at any point during your stay, whether you're in the waiting room, in a room, speaking with a physician, um, your voice truly matters. So so I would I would say it's helpful. And if, if a family has a child who is on um, medications, if they keep a list of the child's current medications and dosages um, kind of in their pocketbook or something or their wallet, something that would be going with them um, in an emergency, not that you should ever take time in an emergency to seek and find information. Um, but if it is maybe more urgent um, than emergent to be ensure you have that, particularly if you're going to an emergency department that is not connected with your child's primary care through electronic medical records, we do often have access to a lot of information that we did not used to have. Um, but if we can know for sure medications a child's on and dosages, um, being sure that all the care providers have a, um, access and information regarding if a child's allergic to certain things. Um, again, we'd have access to that if your child's been cared for at um, the Hershey Health System in the past. But if, 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 you get unaffiliated care or you're traveling sometime and you're going to an ED that doesn't know your family, having that information is really helpful. As well as if you've been referred to the emergency department from another provider um, for care that can't be provided at that location, um, if there's test information or in particular radiology, um, like having it on a disc and bringing that with you to us will save um, some time in our starting either the process over or um, electronically trying to obtain that information. Mm -hmm. So Dr. McCanns, you mentioned, you know, if you may get referred to the emergency department from another provider, let's say, you know, talk a little bit about, for example, if, if you go to an urgent care <coughs> or your pediatrician's office, particularly if you're at an urgent care and, you, and you're there with your child and then, you know, the, the, uh, the staff at the urgent care says, you know, we think we, you need to go to the emergency room instead. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what should the expectation for, for parents and kids be if, if they're in that type of situation, you know? If they, if they feel like, you know, the urgent care doctor says, we think you need a, you know, we, we think you need a higher level of care because that that might, you know, cause some parents to panic. But what should they know about the expectation from moving from, you know, an urgent care to the an, a pediatric emergency department? Yeah, so certainly. So, you know, urgent cares have really expanded the availability of medical care rapidly to a lot of people. But it is uncommon um, to have dedicated pediatric providers um, in urgent care settings. Um, I am not aware of any dedicated pediatric urgent cares in um, South Central Pennsylvania. I could be wrong. Um, and there are other places where there are pediatric urgent cares, but I don't think there's any in our area. And so that urgent care provider, I think, is making a recommendation to go to the emergency department because they also have your child's best interest at heart, and they want the child to get best possible care. But um, since they may be less experienced in caring for children, what they perceive is necessary may not be accurate when the child's being um, evaluated for by um, pediatric providers. And I think a common 
um, thing for that is um, that the child maybe did bang their head and has some symptoms of a concussion um, and families are told, well, you need to go to the emergency department for your child requires um, a, a, a radiologic study, a CAT scan of the head. And then you come to the emergency department, we evaluate the child fully and, and we feel that that's not necessary. <clears throat> In pediatrics, we really try to limit radiologic studies of children that aren't going to have um, a significant um, effect on their care um, because there's risk, long-term risks associated with that. So um, if, if the referral has been made by a non-pediatric provider, it may be that they are really in an abundance of caution um, making the recommendation they are, but we may view what's necessary or appropriate differently. Um, and, and I think, again, to keep in mind that along each step, people are making recommendations um, because they truly want the best possible outcomes and care for your child. And, and then we typically are discussing with the family why we think what we think, why it's necessary, what the risks and benefits are, um, and working with the family to come to a plan that is acceptable to everybody. Mm -hmm. Please excuse my cat. He's obviously curious about this too. <laughs> I apologize. Um, thank you for that, Dr. McKenz. Um, you are watching Ask Us Anything About When to Take Your Child to the Emergency Room with Dr. Kathy McCanns and April Squares from Penn State Health Children's Hospital's Pediatric Emergency Department. Um, and April, I had wanted to ask you this question as well um, when you were talking about what to know when you when you are bringing your child to the emergency room. Is there ever a circumstance where, where uh, a parent or guardian should call ahead and let an emergency room know they are coming, is that necessary or just by nature of it, that is it not necessary? It's usually not necessary. Sometimes if you call your pediatrician beforehand, um, your pediatrician will call in and give us a heads up that you're on your way, but otherwise it's not necessary to give us a advance notice that you're coming in. Okay, um, and is there anything, anything additional that either of you want to add to the question about, you know, what does staff, what does emergency room staff need to know about my, my sick child or my child's condition, you know, is there anything in particular that parents should be prepared for there? I do think that um, if your child has special needs, um, it's really important to share with um, the emergency department things that help that child be more comfortable. Um, when I think of children with significant um, developmental delays or children with um, autism, Sometimes they have very specific things that we would not net be able to um, predict that either makes it easier or harder for that child. And so if families are proactive about saying, you know, this, this is what um, my child is most sensitive or um, that sort of thing, um, we will often ask parents that um, when we realize the child has um, some uh, neurocognitive differences, um, but if, if any provider doesn't ask, parents should be very proactive um, about things that they uniquely know about their child um, that will help us make it a comfortable and positive experience for the child. And generally, if the child has that experience, so does the family. <clears throat> um, and I'm actually glad you brought up, you know, um, kids and adolescents with special needs. Can you guys talk a little bit about, you know, what makes what makes a dedicated pediatric emergency department, you know, different in that area? Because I know Penn State Health Children's Hospital's um, pediatric emergency department has some specific resources for for kids with special needs who might who may need them. Dr. McCanns, did you want to speak to that? Sure. So I really think it's having that full, full spectrum of um, providers that are experienced with taking care of children, um, as well as the additional um, subspecialty physicians who, whether or not they're available in person in the moment or available to us via a phone call to help support a child's need. And additionally, we have um, access to child life, not 24 hours a day, but they're here for a significant number of hours every day, as well as music therapists who they really are wonderful in engaging all our children, but especially those um, with special needs. And then we have some equipment um, that uh, can be helpful 
um, for children with special needs um, available to us. I always forget there's this distracting machine that has lights and strobes. I forget what it's called all the time, but for a child that um, finds that sort of simulation soothing, you know, we can bring that in the room. Um, and by virtue of the fact that we have frequent contact with our child life therapists in particular, they have taught many of us how to bring some of those same skills <clears throat> to the child who is there when child life is not present. Um, we also have, again, a variety of um, supplies through the generosity um, of the health system available um, to make it easier for children. Um, we routinely provide children who are anxious with stress balls or homemade stress balls, um, which again, an ED that's not seeing a large number of children just may not have those sorts of supplies that help distract children, as well as the expertise uh, of people dedicated to trying to make the experience um, as comfortable and positive as possible. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. McCanns, for that. Um, and thank you very much to both of you for joining us, April Squares and Dr. McCanns from Penn State Health Children's Hospital. Um, if there is a question for those of you watching this at home, if there's any questions that we did not answer here, um, if you have any follow-up questions for April and Dr. McCanns, there's still an opportunity to do that. Please feel free to put any questions or comments in the chat below this post, and we will still be able to get an answer for you, even if you're watching this on playback. Thank you again to both of you for joining us and thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you.